So, in replaying Majora's Mask for its 20th anniversary, I wanted to make this retrospective into something more than just, hey Zelda fans, remember that game we talk about all the time? It's 20 years old now. In doing so, I was trying to find new subtexts and reasons to continue picking it apart, and quickly realizing that this particular Zelda title has reflected so much of what we the players want to see in it over the years, but not very often consider the people behind the game's code. We've spent years dissecting its themes, but we often forget how it may reflect its two lead directors, Eji Anuma and Yoshiaki Koizumi. For the countless articles and think pieces out there on Majora's Mask that dig into themes, motifs, story beats, color palettes, remake changes, there's this deep human connection to the player coming from this game more than most other first party Nintendo titles. When we consider this game's directors, we see their ambitions to try something new and having the courage to make it weird. As a result, this video has taken the form of observing their influence on the final product and seeing how their drive for staying creative made one of the most ambitious and experimental action RPGs of its era, and where it got them today. Firstly, I think it's really important to address the work of the late Satoru Iwata, the iconic president of Nintendo with a heart of gold who tragically passed in 2015. He was a man far ahead of his time, but in my research for this video, I've developed a new layer of love for his timeless Iwata Asks interviews. For a company as elusive and secretive as Nintendo is, Iwata was always trying to pull the curtain back to let fans in on their conversations. If you didn't follow them as they were being published in the early 2010s, I truly hope you seek them out to read about your favorite games, because I believe they create this beautiful capsule of the legacy of these last 20 years of Nintendo. I think it'd be nice to know the people who make the games we love a little bit better, and see how pieces of their soul find their way into these softwares that we connect with, especially in something as inherently spiritual as The Legend of Zelda. So that's what this video is about, and I also want to note that it definitely wouldn't exist the way that it does if not for the incredible depth of resource available at DigiNoGaming.com and the DigiNoGaming YouTube channel. Their work of archiving articles and interviews from all across the internet on beloved games in a very accessible way for people to make their own findings is an immeasurable resource to have in an era when retaining media literacy is a really important thing to have in gaming culture. Humans are infinitely obsessed with time. Obsessed with optimizing it, remembering it, tracking how much of it we've lost, looking back and forward. Our minds become lost in a spiral of what has become or what could be, whilst our bodies stay grafted to the present. Some spend most of their lives in this hypnotic state, but time is the only thing truly out of a person's control. Even if our emotional states, proficiencies, and relationships cause our experience of it to ebb and flow, Time marches on despite us. <laughs> this is the curse of having a childhood with The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time at your side. What a twist, right? That, uh, that threw you for a loop. The Nintendo 64 gave players one of the most revolutionary experiences in a 3D video game, and echoes of its final product can still be seen in almost every 3D action RPG today. Ocarina of Time is still lauded by many as the greatest game of all time, whatever that means anymore. The semantics of this could be argued for its blueprinting the direction of the industry, its ubiquitous fantasy adventure, or our rose-tinted glasses, but its shadow is undoubtedly large. When Eji Anuma was asked to direct a follow-up to one of the most successful games of the 1990s, maybe ever, he gambled away his time to get it done just so that he could stoke the fires of his creativity. At the time, a direct sequel to a Zelda game was unheard of, but he and the Zelda team were brave enough to give it a try, albeit with pressure to turn some quick extra profit with the success of Ocarina. 
From a fan's perspective, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that the greatest enjoyment of Majora's Mask comes from experiencing Ocarina's legendary adventure first. Its jarring nature is made only more complex when the gameplay, visuals, songs, and details are stripped from Ocarina's legend and distorted into something completely new. But we also as players have a fundamental understanding of these 3D mechanics because Ocarina taught us how to use them. Majora's Mask, compared to its predecessor, was born of a need for simplicity, efficiency, and strong time management. When discussing the original game upon the release of the 2015 Majora's Mask 3D, a remake for the Nintendo 3DS, Anuma considered Majora's original version a literal challenge to returning and devoted players, especially in regards to the lack of tutorials for the basics of platforming, puzzles and combat, thrusting players into the new scenario. We never worked on a remake for Majora's Mask until now, so we did go in thinking that the reactions would be somewhat positive. But to be honest, the reactions we received were much stronger than we had anticipated. Why do you think that was the case? I think that's because Majora's Mask is the kind of game that presents players with a challenge. What? It's a challenge to our customers? When we talked about The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time in a previous Awada Asks, we talked about hospitality. But Majora's Mask isn't like that. It's all a challenge to our players. It's like we're saying to them, can you clear this? It shifted from hospitality to a challenge. It was something like until then you were welcomed with open arms, being invited to come in. And now, you're being told at the door to go home if you don't have what it takes. <laughs> that might be true. When I played the game when it came out, it was like the game itself was screaming out to me, questioning me whether I had the dedication to play forward. That's because we didn't put any elements where we show people how to play this game. The game was made for those who have played Ocarina of Time, so I felt like there wasn't a need for step-by-step -step instructions. It was like, clear it if you can. So those who have played it still strongly remember how the game felt like it was a challenge. For the five people who never played Ocarina of Time, <laughs> what are you doing here? Uh, but here's the story. Link was a child in the land of Hyrule, blessed with great purpose and guided by a fairy to help Princess Zelda save the kingdom from the Lord of Evil by collecting spiritual relics and taking a weapon that would transport him seven years into the future to conquer Ganondorf. When his long coming-of-age tale was completed, Zelda played one last song on the Ocarina of Time to send Link back to his past so he could regain his lost childhood. However, he would live this life cursed with the consciousness of an adult war hero. His companion fairy Navi, a symbol of that youth he carried with him, leaves in the final shots of the game. Majora's Mask dares to ask, what happens after this? What happens when a child is suddenly thrust into becoming the time-traveling hero of the goddesses and when it's all over, put back in his old life? Link's path in this game sees him resisting that flow as he searches for Navi across unknown worlds to recapture the friend who was alongside him as he literally and emotionally grew up. It's deep in the woods, where he's attacked by Skull Kid, wearing the evil, haunted Majora's Mask, after which his horse, his strength, and his weapons are stolen, and he's cursed into the appearance of a childish Deku scrub. When Link explores the world of Termina on the other side of the woods, he encounters a town preparing for a carnival of time, and a foreboding, apocalyptic moon hanging overhead that will collide with the Earth in three days. There is a distinct contrast to his heroics in Ocarina when addressed by the inhabitants of Clocktown as though he is a kid with no understanding of how dire the state of the world is. But when Link regains his human form, the very song Zelda used to send him back to his past becomes the game's primary mechanic to save and reset the clock to 72 hours before the moon crashes. These townspeople, most of whom are familiar faces from his past journey, begin their routine once again, none the wiser. And save for the masks that Link collects as memento of new friendships, there's no evidence that he ever helped them. This game's assets between the music, the character models, collectibles, items, even the masks originate from Ocarina of Time. But much like all the other things carried over, their purpose and power are distorted into something strange. With them followed the Happy Mask Salesman, a foolish yet foreboding harbinger who begs Link to complete his quest in recovering the haunted Majora's Mask. Anuma has addressed the masks being carried over from Ocarina to Majora mechanically and evolving as a natural necessity with their limitations. As a basis of Zelda games, you are able to use items to do all sorts of different things, and we felt it would be a lot of fun if Link would acquire all these abilities by putting on these different masks. We felt that it would expand the gameplay, so we made the game so Link could transform into Deku Link to fly into the air, Goron Link to roll across the land, and Zora Link so that he could swim underwater. We also gave each of them a storyline. 
three of the game's masks are essential transformation totems. Through them, Link embodies the forms of characters who have gone beyond the land of the living. He takes on the form of the Deku Butler's son, the Goron's war hero Darmani, and the Zora Band's lead guitarist Mikao. All three stories are ones filled with themes of regret for what they haven't been able to do for the people they left behind and really care about. And on their gravestones are instructions, leaving behind simple tutorials for players to control their forms through gameplay. In reminiscing the development of Ocarina of Time after spending even more time as a producer on the remakes for 3DS, Anuma notes regrets of his own as a designer. There was a sense of unfulfillment among the staff, where a lot of us wanted to do things differently with certain elements from Ocarina of Time, and also wanting to do things they weren't able to do before. If we gathered all new staff to work on it, it would have been impossible to make in only a year. You were fueled by your regrets of what you made but weren't able to fully use to fruition. Because you were fueled by it, you were able to put on a bunch of new ideas on top of the three-day system, and they all fit together nicely. That's why you were able to make something with so much content in only a year. I suppose so. Also, I was younger back then. People have spent years deconstructing the themes of Majora's story content, but its purpose was to make a new Zelda adventure using all the years of hard work from creating the journey before. While Zelda is known for its many temples to explore, Majora only has four main dungeons. However, the side quests and mini dungeons before and after them are so complex and rich with character and atmosphere, and all with a distinct style of level design of their own that makes exceptional use of 3D space, that their relationship with the temples in Ocarina feels like an evolutionary one. Additionally, the scenarios in Clock Town and its surrounding regions feel like dungeon gauntlets of their own despite being mostly fetch quests. Combined with four temples that make a step beyond a link to the past with a z-axis, and creative use of the space to build a weaving complexity to their labyrinthian layouts, this title would give Zelda its greatest content density to date. While it didn't sell like its predecessor, it made the most of what the Nintendo 64 was visually capable of, and has become a cult classic ever since, famously the black sheep of the Zelda franchise. When asked about it while consulting the 3DS remake of Majora's Mask, Ezio Numa treated the game from 2000 as a frightful memory from much younger days. When giving the remaster team Grezzo notes on the work to be done, he would remark on his past choices. At the time, I think there was something wrong with me. I knew I didn't want to open the lid from the get-go, and it turned out that my instincts were correct. This is typical of any creative mind looking back at work over a decade old, and yet it's easy to forget the circumstances under which Majora's Mask was created. Considering this, it's a miracle that the game exists as it does, if at all. Naturally, a player can see the rough edges from such a limited production time in some of the game's choices, such as backtracking, repeated tasks, and egregiously using the same Wizrobe miniboss four times throughout the game, but if anything, these faults should make it clear how incredible it is that the best things in the game were made under such limiting circumstances. It was the terrifying first step Anuma and his peers would make to use Shigeru Miyamoto's baby to transform it into something of their own. Twenty years later, that risk of sticking to their instincts still holds for fans and has seen wild success in their careers in the years following the Moody Little Zelda sequel. In 2020, we take for granted that video games evoke themes beyond the routine of a player reflexively tapping buttons. Once upon a time, it was a marvel to simply witness a 3D game like Super Mario 64. So many things we've come to take for granted in modern video games had been established rapidly over a small amount of time in the late 90s. When games took their first steps into 3D, they were at first mere expansions of the design fundamentals of 2D games with that added axis. It was games like Carmack and Romero's Doom and Miyamoto experimenting experimenting with that Super FX chip to get Star Fox on the SNES that would lay the groundwork for 3D perspectives as a completely new fundamental component of traversing level design and combat navigation well before the Nintendo 64 and the PlayStation ever hit the market. This is essential to clarify, because it's often easy to forget how revolutionary it felt to play Ocarina of Time, Eji Anuma's first project under a directorial position. When compared to modern action-adventure RPGs, Ocarina hasn't aged the greatest. 
greatest. However, the first 3D Zelda adventure brought with it a substantial upgrade to the world and dungeon layouts blueprinted by A Link to the Past in 1991. Ocarina provided just as many richly populated open spaces to explore as it did tight corridors with obstacles. Although the dungeons often reflected A Link to the Past's map layouts, awareness puzzles, switch and block puzzles, and similarly moving enemy varieties, exploring all these components on a Z-axis brought new life to their usefulness. Combined with this depth was a mechanic just for navigating combat in these new spaces, Z-targeting, what we now fundamentally understand as a lock-on system. It was used for battle engagement, turning the slashing of your sword into a rhythmic bout with enemies, an idea brought on board by Super Mario 64's assistant director Yoshiaki Koizumi. He revealed in a 2011 Iwata Asks interview that the concept came one summer from seeing a circular battle choreography in a Ninja Samurai showdown at Toei Kyoto Studio Park. This ended up setting the standard for the majority of action-based gameplay to this day, and demonstrated the innovative skills of Koizumi and Nintendo's staff as they began reworking their franchises into wild and new ideas for 3D. I was a designer, so I didn't want to use such a simple marker. I wanted to make something else, so I came up with a fairy. After all, it was The Legend of Zelda. The sometimes overlooked Master Quest expansion disc for the Nintendo 64 DD was released as a GameCube port for Wind Waker pre-orders in the West, and was an important stepping stone following the explosive success of Ocarina of Time. With that release came a completely redesigned dungeon layout to provide more of a puzzling and combative challenge, an immense paradigm shift for players who knew the game's dungeon layouts already. Master Quest often asked players to rethink how to solve puzzles entirely, using all the same room layouts and item acquisitions but with a higher density of foes, alternate paths, and unique physics not often asked of people in the base game. However, Eji Anuma, who had his first directorial experience alongside Miyamoto on Ocarina of Time, wanted to force the series staple to evolve. The Master Quest expansion paved the way for Zelda Team's next task. Fans often recall the story of Ocarina of Time's second quest, or Zelda Gaiden, and how that turned into an entirely new game, Becoming Majora, based on an argument between series pioneer Shigeru Miyamoto and Anuma himself, who was tasked with directing the follow-up alone this time around. For years, even Satoru Iwata didn't know of this origin story, but this infamous gamble of a deadline to make an entirely new Zelda title instead would work its way into the game's core mechanic and shape how iterative game design would be seen forever, ironically not often used by Nintendo itself. This game, however, would be a standalone release, using only the assets, engine, and audiovisual leftovers from Ocarina, and with Anuma's pitch, they only had one year to do it. The Nintendo 64 marked the beginning of the company no longer having complete domination over the industry. As Sega was still in the race with the Dreamcast, Sony was about to launch its hotly anticipated PlayStation 2, and Microsoft was entering the ring to release the Xbox, all before the launch of the GameCube. This second Zelda for the Nintendo 64's last year of development had a lot riding on it, especially now that Ocarina had placed Zelda firmly as a top priority for Nintendo. And as Satoru Iwata was moving up the ranks to the role of president, Miyamoto would also be taking a step back directly designing games for the first time in his beloved fantasy franchise. Anuma and Koizumi had a lot of pressure on them, but shared enough experience between themselves and the rest of Zelda team to get Majora completed on time. This task would force Anuma to work closely with the team he already had on the previous title to get the work done efficiently, but this still carried great weight, even in his dreams. I had a dream about it. What kind of a dream was it? It was a dream about being chased by a Deku. Oh, a dream where you were being chased around? I was thinking about an event for the Deku, and have been trying to figure out what to do with it. I thought of it at home, and Deku's appeared in my dream. I woke up screaming, I went to work the next day, and that's when Kawagoe-san told me that he finished making a movie for the Dekus, so I had him show it to me, and that movie was exactly like my dream. I even told him, how do you know about my dream? <laughs> that's how put up against the edge I was back then. Perhaps you were possessed by something. Possibly. Anuma, who was merely a carpenter before hired by Nintendo to make games in the late 80s, had researched different genres and found himself engaging with text-based adventures and puzzle games early in his career. So it came as no surprise that his work on Ocarina under Miyamoto's co-direction would result in some of the most story-driven games to date, and the most iconic RPG dungeons in gaming history, particularly and perhaps most notoriously, the Water Temple. Therefore, while Master Quest was a fascinating experiment, it made sense that he would want to stretch the boundaries of what they could do with Zelda. 
Thankfully, after a plea for help, Anuma found a co-director in Yoshiaki Koizumi, the story architect of A Link to the Past, assistant director on Super Mario 64, and one of those aforementioned innovators of Z-targeting in Ocarina. This pairing was pivotal because these two creators were operating in a wildly uncertain era of Nintendo's history and the sands of time were shifting around them when the industry and the company were changing. Even when I was making The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, I was still designing different things of demo movies and was working on the field work at the end. In the next work, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, I was going to be in charge of designing the dungeons. But somehow, I became the director. I felt anxious about being the only director, so I called in Yoshiaki Kozumi, who was the 3D director for Ocarina. When I asked him to join us, he said, I'd go only if you let me do whatever I want to do. And the result was a three-day system. The unique design and directing styles of these two creators would come to fruition during Majora's production. Anuma's efforts and passions would result in some of the franchise's most puzzling and thematically unique dungeons to date in the series. Koizumi, on the other hand, focused on the design of the layouts, characters, and quests inside of Clocktown, the hub at the center of the game's map. These innovations came after coming up with the mechanic to build a restrictive time loop as a core function of the game, something inspired by him seeing the film Run Lola Run in 1998, and his attempt at building a cops and robbers concept with interweaving schedule mechanics. This became the three-day cycle, and along with tracking the people of Termina and the Bomber's Notebook, it would take the puzzle fundamentals of Zelda's dungeons and inject them into conversational text quests, which weaved simultaneously with the game's larger narrative. The time loop mechanic worked to Anuma and Koizumi's advantage while making Majora in such a small amount of time. Game designers have to program spaces with selectively few characters, music, weather conditions, paths, and dialogue in a way that is limiting what the player can experience but while keeping those limits invisible to the players. Majora's Mask manages to use those limitations to its advantage. While Termina's map was significantly smaller than Ocarina's Hyrule, its regions would have a variety of states depending on when the player arrives, or if it's in a poisoned or restored state. Additionally, the character's behaviors changed based on their schedule and whether or not Link had interfered. The result is a lived-in quality for a lean, richly populated environment, incentivizing players to do every side quest they can manage to reap the rewards in the form of masks, tools, and pieces of heart. The game functions uniquely by having characters with a finite routine, and are expected to do so as the players experience the same three days over and over again in their task to stop Skull Kid from crashing the moon down upon them. On the first day, people mind their own business about town. On the second day, they begin to grow dreadful, angry, and divided as the moon lurches closer to the earth. On the third day, they flee, they hide, they become fearful, regretful, they mourn events that had no savior. Unless Link comes to save them in time, they meet their demise, and the clock resets. Thanks to his ocarina, Link has the power to turn back time in the game, but it comes at a cost. Majora's Mask, whether intentionally or accidentally, deconstructs the heroism of Link. He begins the game clinging to his past after he's been through hell and back to defeat Ganon, searching for his childhood companion, but he instead meets a fairy who is the opposite of her in Tattle who's brash, stubborn, and a little nihilistic. However, their goals ultimately are the same as she's separated from her dear brother Tail. Stripped of his humanity and locked in a strange nexus of the universe, Link is surrounded by familiar circumstances, faces, and goals, but all with a nightmarish quality cycling itself in a veil of dream logic. With only three days to save everyone from a brutal end and a garish moon constantly threatening to obliterate them, Link is forced to run around doing errands and getting to know the characters in Clocktown and Termina. Sometimes these tasks are big, like restoring a poison swamp or saving a mountain from an eternal winter or saving an ocean from... I don't even know what's happening there. But others are as simple as reuniting a married couple, providing a strange man with a portrait of a pirate lady, listening to a long story, or passing on a dancer's dream to a new generation. Link is a conduit for the people who are suffering a loss or are close to death or regretting things in their lives. Even if he needs to reset the clock and restore everyone to their miserable states on the first day, he carries totems signifying their memory in the form of collectible masks. By reusing these characters and items, the music, the sounds, with purposeful restrictive mechanics, Majora's Mask shows a dense complexity with a meaningful thematic purpose to every side quest, and many of them come with interlinked consequences over the three days. As a result, the themes of selfless heroism and grief routinely find a way of growing beyond what the characters say, and change is made out of what the player does to catalyze the character's routine. As a result, Link grows as a person without saying anything at all, and the people you see on screen become more 
more than non-playable characters and are suddenly people playing their role in a story, and the items you collect suddenly have more meaning. A key example of this is best demonstrated in a secondary character, a young red-haired woman named Anju. When you meet her in Ocarina of Time, she stands by her chicken pen in Kakariko Village and asks you to gather her kukos for her. When you return the chickens, she gifts you a glass bottle and then that's it. Her role's fulfilled. But when you meet her doppelganger in Majora's Mask, she's the clerk of a hotel. She's worried about her fiancé, Cafe, who's gone missing three days before their wedding. And Link can follow her, discovering her relationships with her mother and other people, and is sometimes rewarded for doing so. Seeing it aloud, it's a little creepy, but it works from a time-traveling game perspective. Alternatively, Link and the players can knowingly manipulate events that they know are going to happen to learn more about her, and when they do, the routines of many people become disrupted as a result. Particularly a poor Goron who can't get his reservation and has to sleep in the rain. This weaving complexity combines both the charming writing and puzzle solving of Anuma's designs and Koizumi's unconventional event design into a marriage of sorts. The Anju and Cafe quest in particular ends as they reunite at the 11th hour, and the moon is about to fall, and they gift a mask to Link as their witness in matrimony. Anuma once recalled them having a particular anxiety over a potential missile crisis coming from North Korea as they attended a wedding. We were attending a wedding of a staff member, and we were talking with Koizumi and the others. Come to think of it, it's somewhat strange to come to a wedding in a situation when missiles may fall down today. The discussion progressed into noting how it would also fit the setting of a falling moon and whether to do a wedding in the game. Now that I think of it, no matter where we go, we always talk about work. <laughs> However, I didn't mind at the time. Anuma would reminisce much later in an interview that Majora's Mask was his favorite game in the franchise, in large part due to his love for this couple's mask quest. The scene was based on my generation's perception of marriage, but was meant to be solved at the end to make the players feel dramatic. So the waiting process was put in intentionally. We dragged it out until the very end. Game designers often strive for players empathizing with main characters, and NPCs tend to be the afterthought, and yet Majora's Mask's secondary characters drive the heart of the story tangential to Link's quest. The rewards resulting from these specially crafted diversions come in the form of 25 collectible masks. These quests can be introspective personal problems or monstrous external threats, and yet they all have an emotional weight. Link can make a very distinct impact on most of the townsfolk's lives, at least to the best of his ability. A player feels the same pressure of the clock as Link and make the conscious choice of hitting reset themselves. Many over the years have attempted to save every character in one clock cycle before the moon crashes by strategizing tasks and optimizing time, but of course it's not possible by design, because the developers wanted you to make those choices. Even though many of the masks have only a couple of use cases in gameplay, they are often pivotal to changing the fate of another character, with Link as the conduit. It is a tone that resonates with the humanity and the players, but often overlooked is its clashing and emulsifying tones and ideas, as demonstrated in this interview between Anuma, Koizumi, and Miyamoto in 2012. To put it simply, I was responsible for the fairy tale sections, and Koizumi was responsible for creating realistic depictions of the lives of the townspeople. I tried to emulate the fantasy atmosphere we had in Ocarina of Time and I created realistic lives for the characters. You could say that Koizumi slapped his worldview on the whole thing. I put in everything I've seen in my 30-something years on this earth. It's a very serious game. Aonuma was in charge of the outdoors, and when he saw how serious my town was, he made his areas of the game more lighthearted. Of course, Anuma and Koizumi were simply keeping their heads down and grinding their way to the finish line, unable to know that their efforts would see them as the lead producers of Nintendo's two biggest franchises in the years to come. And as Majora's Mask was the platform they first stepped upon to prove themselves, seeds of this game could be seen throughout Nintendo's library even to this day. The two would work together on the controversial The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker on the GameCube achieving a timeless cell shaded look that admittedly put aging, sensitive fans in the defense as the franchise leaned a little more appealing to children. Koizumi would take his wild ideas and give us a water jetpack in Super Mario Sunshine, repurpose the DK bongos into an action platformer with Donkey Kong Jungle Beat, and has consistently reinvented core Super Mario games with installments like Galaxy, 3D Land, and Odyssey, all with the wild level design and unique mechanical upending that he's demonstrated throughout his entire career at Nintendo. Few more iconic than Majora's Mask's three-day cycle. 
Anuma, following the release of Majora's Mask, would continue being the producer at the head of the Zelda ship, and while he would leave his love for puzzles and text-based adventures scattered throughout, what he loves in the series often clashed with the status of other popular games at the time, like Oil and Water. It's on the eve of the Switch and the Breath of the Wild launching that an interview with Game Informer asked him to name his favorite three games in the series. He named Ocarina for his chance to build in 3D, Twilight Princess to supersede Ocarina, and controversially named Phantom Hourglass and Triforce Heroes, firstly for new styles of gameplay, but mainly his wife's enjoyment of them. Even when asked what his favorite version of Link was, he named Toon Link because it was the one being made while his son was being born. His design fundamentals come from a place of building, and it comes no surprise that his love for making games comes from a desire to upend convention, always looking to reinvent what a Zelda game is at every chance he gets. When he first started playing games, he didn't even care for the original NES Zelda all that much because he found he was bad at fast, twitchy combat. Naturally, under his supervision, combat since became a more puzzle-solving scenario. But it's in Breath of the Wild that his desire to reinvent Zelda met with the needs of its audience, as the most successful game in the series to date, and also the one he's had the most fun producing. I've been making Zelda titles for almost my entire career, and the memories start to pile up. I start to forget things, but I think one thing I've always been proud of is the fact that Zelda games have always been about new surprises and thinking about different things to try, yet still maintain that Zelda-ness, or whatever it is. Breath of the Wild. It was really fun to develop, maybe the most fun I've ever had making a game. It was because of the staff. They took so much initiative and were always looking at everything in the game with this eye to improve. I could see it every day. As a producer, it gave me a lot of courage. For Anuma, his continued work and the way he speaks demonstrates that no matter how big The Legend of Zelda gets, he's always looking to change it and always keeps it very personally close to his heart. It is because Anuma and Koizumi stayed true to their passions for directing that Majora's Mask is the way that it is, and seeing the game that way makes it feel even more alive than it ever did before. The spark that created Majora's Mask the way that it is at that moment is hard to pinpoint, even to the degree that Anuma and his staff agree that the game was incomparable to others at the time, and still is in the 20 years since. I heard that hardcore players love The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask more, so it's kind of ironic for me. To be honest with you, I can only get approval for development because I made a game of that size back then. If you ask me to make that kind of game again, I can't do it. Part of that spark may have been the uncertain energy in the company at the time, or the cultivating of talent in the young staff, but Majora's Mask is the only instance a full adventure has been allowed to be made out of the assets already built for a Zelda game. For a couple of years, a sequel to Wind Waker was being planned for the GameCube, and because of the low enthusiasm from the fanbase on the game at the time, the plans shifted to create a more realistic game in Twilight Princess. Similarly, Anuma and Zelda team desperately wanted to create a proper direct sequel adventure in Twilight Princess's engine, and were unable to due to strict instruction from Miyamoto at the producer level to make it a Wii Zapper tie-in. No story, two boss fights. Of course, that game became Link's crossbow training. The opportunity to make a direct sequel to a game of Majora's ilk has yet to truly come up. It hasn't been until now, after the success of Breath of the Wild, that the Zelda team has been able to use their hard work at rebuilding a Zelda engine from scratch to make one extra game, as we've seen in the single trailer for the currently unnamed sequel that has fans reminiscing their love of Majora 20 years later. Whether that game will get to be anything like it is yet to be discovered. Majora's Mask's legacy has left a great impact over the years because of its tone, its themes, and its unique nature apart from its sister software in the Zelda franchise. However, its spirit is carried in small details throughout Anuma and Koizumi's careers. It is a game that is more personal to the fundamentals of these two men's passions for designing games, but also, in a stressful and uncertain time, they managed to turn it into a work of art by injecting it with their personalities and their fears. While so many people over the years connect with Majora for its atmosphere, performing countless autopsies to pull deeper meaning, Nintendo's productions always have a mystique about them and the game spoke for itself. But now, coming away with an understanding of their artistic flourishes, this game feels human in a way that it presents its world to players. Themes of despair and grief and pain, sorrow, salvation, legacy, hope, Link sees a bit of himself in every individual who gifts him a mask throughout this journey and in turn, that allows the game's architects to convey their experiences and musings to the players. The humanity of Majora's strange world just might be something that causes it to overshadow even Ocarina's revolutionary status the further we get from its release. But only time will tell.